Please welcome to the She Summit stage our next panel, Breaking Barriers in Sports. Please welcome to the stage Victoria Arlen, host and reporter at ESPNW, Paralympian gold medalist in swimming and author of Locked In. Mina Kimes, senior writer, radio host, and television commentator, ESPN. Chene Ogumike, ESPN basketball analyst, co-host, Sports Center, ESPN Africa. And moderator, Allison Overholt, vice president, editor-in-chief of ESPN The Magazine and ESPNW. Thank you for having us. So I hope you all had a wonderful lunch and you're ready to settle in for a great conversation. We're here to talk with these three incredible women about breaking barriers in sports, and each one of them has done that in her own incredible way. So today, just to give you a little bit more background on who you're hearing from today, um, Shanae is a professional basketball player for the WNBA's Connecticut Sun, and she's also a full-time ESPN commentator. So she's calling basketball games on our air. She co-hosts SportsCenter Africa, and she has her own podcast with The Undefeated, which is our website um, at the intersection of race, culture, and sports called The Plug. Uh, Mina Kimes is an award-winning journalist who began her ESPN and sports media career writing for ESPN the magazine in 2014. And in just these last four years, she has skyrocketed and gone on to become a major player on shows like Around the Horn, First Take, The Dan Levitard Show, Highly Questionable. She co-hosts The Morning Roast on ESPN Radio on the weekends. And she just launched an NFL podcast called The Mina Kimes Show. So hopefully you'll all subscribe after this. <clears throat> and Victoria Arlen is a features reporter and a host on ESPN. She began on air with us in 2015 reporting from the Special Olympics World Games. Um, and now you'll see her everywhere. She's on college game day. She's reporting from the X Games. She's doing NCAA swimming and diving coverage. She's even been on ABC's Dancing with the Stars. Um, <laughs> now, Victoria's story has additional layers to it that are so important to get right that I actually printed it out and I'm gonna read this to you because it's, it's that important to sink in. Um, so, at 11 years old, Victoria was diagnosed with two rare conditions, transverse myelitis and acute disseminated encepho encephalomyelitis. Good job. That right? that, those are mouthfuls. So, the yeah. thing to know there is that she lost the ability to speak, to eat, to walk, to move. Um, doctors believe she had little chance of, recover of survival, let alone recovery. Um, and so, you know, she spent the next four years of her life in a persistent vegetative state and shortly after had to become, begin that very, very long, difficult road um, back to just learning everyday tasks, learning just how to be in the world. Um, but as you heard, you know, she went on in 2012 to qualify to compete in the 2012 London Paralympic Games, and she won a gold medal in the 100-meter freestyle event. <laughs> She actually set a new world record time. And one of the things that I always think back to is that when I first met Victoria, when she started with ESPN, she was in a wheelchair. Um, and already we thought, you know, my gosh, how, how is this woman able to do what she does, speaking of breaking barriers? And then a year later, she reached out Surprise. and said, I have a story <laughs> to tell. Um, she's clearly not only walking, but competing on dance competitions. So we're gonna have an entire another layer to talk about in terms of you know, what it takes to break barriers. Okay, so we've set the table here. Each one of you is tremendously accomplished. Um, each of you are doing things that no one's done before. Um, so athletics, media, the thing they have in common is this idea of preparation. We prepare a lot. Can you talk to us about how each of you prepares to do what you do? Preparation is everything. Um, you know, being a basketball player, that's pretty much what I've learned since I was 10 years old. I started playing basketball at 10. Um, I play for the Connecticut Sun currently. Who's been to a WNBA game, anybody? Woo! Yes, right that's the energy, I'm at the right place. Um, so I started playing basketball at the age of 10. I come from, quote unquote, a basketball family. My older sister, Neko Gomeke, she plays for the Los Angeles Sparks. I play for the Sun. My little sisters actually play at Rice University. But we fell into basketball and we fell in love with it. And I come from a family of immigrants. So my parents, they left Nigeria and somehow ended up in Greeley, Colorado, 
Um, I was like, how does that happen? Um, I was like, do you even, like, how did you breathe the same air? Um, <laughs> so they met, fell in love, uh, moved to Houston, Texas, and started a family. Sort of the true American dream. H-Town, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should not have taken away that one. Okay, but I, I regress. I regress. I'm sorry. I clearly am an H-Town stan. <laughs> I know. I'm, I forget I'm on the East Coast sometimes. So my parents, um, they started a family in Houston, Texas, and uh, coming, if you know any Nigerians, uh, we, we have pretty strong work ethics. And so they put us into basketball because practically four girls growing up, we destroyed the house. Um, I remember once, you know those like great atlases, we slid down them um, from our stairs. That was like the number one pastime. Busted a hole in the wall and my parents were like, after this, it's done. Um, so they put us into a constructive act activity and it was basketball. And we absolutely stunk. And I always tell people the first outfit I wore to basketball to sports was jorts embroidered with a butterfly, glasses, halter top, uh, yes. the whole works. I wasn't wearing Nikes, I wasn't wearing Adidas, I was wearing Keds. You know, back <laughs> when, too. back when, oh my. First basketball practice, I fell into it because I was doing gymnastics and then someone said, There you go. You should not be <laughs> Precisely. Yeah, Keds, Keds they were practice. known for like hospital shoes, no offense, um, back then. So we went and we played, and Neka's first shot went straight over, not even the basket, over the scoreboard, which was on top of the basket. And we're like, why did you put us in something where we're absolutely horrible at? We didn't even know we were you know, tall for that age. Um, so, I mean, who knew? Uh, besides some of my classmates, obviously. Um, and we, we fell into basketball, and we fell in love with it, and we wondered, why did our parents put us into basketball? And it was precisely because they understood that there's so many great values, you know, preparation, hard work, work ethic. And we learned those lessons going from bad to decent, decent to okay, okay to good, good to great. Um, so it was ingrained in me at the age of 10. And I always say basketball was my vehicle, but there's so many different vehicles in life. It could be music, it could be art, it could be work. Um, you could be doing something that applies you know, to you, it's work, but you could also be working at something else that you love, right? So I fell into basketball, didn't like it, but it ends up transforming my life. And those, the same mentality that I take playing in the WNBA is the mentality I have going to work at ESPN. A lot of people say, how is it different being on TV? And you know, I was like, it's actually pretty much the same because when that red light goes, when that ball tips up, game's on. You know, people are watching, millions of people are watching, so how are you gonna be successful? For me, it was preparation, knowing as much as I can that I, I tried as hard as I could going into practice, um, try to, you know, I tried to prepare as much because we know when you talk about a male sport, you talk about the mm. NFL, you talk about the NBA, you talk about the X Games, right? Mm. People automatically have preconceived notions about what you know and what you don't know. Granted, we're there because we actually are overqualified. We are overqualified because that's why we have a seat at the table. So for us, you know, it's being prepared to let people understand that, hey, get past me being a woman here, get past me being just a, you know, a WNBA player, I'm a basketball player, I'm a TV analyst, it's not necessarily being defined by my gender. And it started for me when I was 10 and sucked at basketball pretty much. I love it, I love it. So Mina, you were saying earlier, you called yourself a prep nerd, like, what do you mean by that? Yes, I have had to learn to prepare less. So it's a little bit of a different um, story. Yeah, so basically, I grew up with a Korean mother, so basically an A minus is a Korean F, as we called it. And so I grew up really, you know, <laughs> studying super hard, always um, over, like, turned things in early, was that kid growing up. And then that transferred to the early part of my career uh, where I was a reporter. And being a reporter, you have to, I'd say 90% of it is the stuff you do before the interview, the reading, the analysis. I was a financial journalist like Ali, and um, just the reading financial documents, doing all that legwork. Etc. And that has continued into writing sports features, writing with athletes. I watch so much tape, I do everything. However, uh, lately in my career, I've done more radio and television, as she mentioned. And when I first started doing it, I, the very first thing I did at ESPN was a fantasy football radio show. And on Sunday mornings, glamorous. And <laughs> I came in every weekend with 40 pages of notes, and they would laugh. And which, some of that stems from, and I think you guys, some of you can probably relate to this, as Shanae mentioned, I am very conscious that a male colleague of mine could make a hundred mistakes and no one will notice. I could break down every element of the Ravens defense and then get one like slightly thing wrong and my Twitter's full of you know, hundred dudes correcting me. That's always in my head. 
you have to override that. And I have had to learn to actually not only override those fears, but also do less prep work so I can be more relaxed, more natural, be myself, and not feel like I have to get everything perfect and I have to come in with those 40 pages of notes. So I've spent the last couple of years really trying to find balance between doing the prep work, which we do have to do because it, it's what makes us good at our jobs, but not feeling pressure to over-prepare, especially when it comes to television and radio. Yeah. So Victoria, how do you even prepare for what you've gone through? I mean, there's, there's no... Which part? <laughs> any of it. I mean, there is no yeah. roadmap for the path that your life is taking you on. Not at all. I think uh, I've always lived by this mentality of like, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And so even, uh, yeah, all right, oh on. <laughs> um, even when I was sick, like those four years, I was completely aware the whole time. So I was locked inside and uh, I just manifested. I envisioned what I was wanting to do, who I wanted to be, and I would listen to the news. I, uh, I was a bit of a Good Morning America junkie. And so while my parents were watching the news or the Food Network show, which is not a fun show to watch if you can't eat, uh, thanks, Dad. Um, I learned how to cook. I learned what was going on in the world. And so for my whole life, I've just decided that you just have to always be prepared, whatever it is you want to embark on. And um, no one prepares to spend four years in a vegetative state. No one prepares to die. No one does any of that. But for me, I just had to think about living. I had to think about what am I going to do when I get better, when I get out of this, what's next? And always having that one foot ahead mindset but to an extent, because I think sometimes my mom has to like say, like, just sit and watch TV, like just chill, take a chill pill. And so it's finding that balance. Um, but whether it was swimming or walking or all of that, it's just always being ready, always mentally preparing before you even get there. And I think with anything that we want to do, especially being women, you have to almost mentally prepare and go in with your head held high. And, and uh, even when I started at ESPN, I was 20. And so a lot of the things we were talking about, I wasn't even born yet. And I got a lot of flack for that. So uh, for me, it was always like, just be prepared and be kind of one step ahead and, and don't let your circumstances, your age, your gender, anything get in the way of that. Just know you're, you're here for a job to do and, and whether it's a challenge or it's a job or sometimes jobs can be challenging, you just have to kind of stay ready and, and prepare to the best of your ability. Yep. So I love what you said when you, when you said, you know, you're, you're laying there and you're visualizing. Yeah. where you want to be, who you want to be. So one of the things we wanted to talk a little bit about is goal setting. Yeah. Um, you know, research tells us if you, if you even take the step of setting a goal, you are that much more likely to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Then if you write it down, that much more still. And then if you actually extrovert that, if you start mm -hmm. telling people what the goal is that you've committed to, yeah. um, you're that much more. So I always like to ask people who are super successful, are you a goal setter? Because like, people tell us this, right? So how does that work for you guys? I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the first one to tell you. Um, you know, it's funny. A lot of people meet me, professional athletes, so cool, you know? And I get roasted by my sisters. I'm the weird one in the family. Um, I'm, well, corny is their operative word, but um, for me with goals, I've really felt that staying true to who I am is number one. Um, because this world, the society, especially with social media, will try to bend you and will try to break you and will try to make you question yourself. In every stage of my life, I've just tried to remember, you know, who am I and what do I care about and what are my passions and then channel all that energy into that direction, right? So when people say, oh, you must have had a goal to, you know, be a number one recruit in high school. You must have had a goal to go to Stanford University. You must have had a goal to be number one draft. Well, I did actually after my sister got drafted. I thought, okay, you can't want to be like whatever. Um, <laughs> but I really didn't. I really didn't. I just think I was just driven by my hunger to um, just overall be successful. But I do believe goals have power. So, and when you say it out loud, you hold yourself accountable to that because you've told someone, which is why it's important not just to tell, you don't have to tell everyone, but maybe one person that you trust because that person will always keep you in check. What's but what, a goal that you've told somebody? A goal that I've told someone? Honestly, and this is why I say I'm weird. I don't really define myself in goals. I define myself more so in, in my hustle, right? Because um, I feel like for so long, growing up, you know, my parents, immigrant parents, Nigerian Asians, pretty, pretty much the same with parents. Um, 
you have the, the ladder of success for our previous generation was, okay, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, you have to go to school, you have to go to college, you have to do this to be successful. The game has changed with technology. We're in a really, really um, you know, seminal period here where we can do things out of the box. Young people, startups, Facebook, all that type of stuff, which they need to be careful, by the way. Um, they, they really changed the game in, in timeline, right? So for me, it's just about staying true to who I am, working as hard as I can, and being a yes woman. Um, I know Shonda Rhimes came out with a book, but I was always looking in my head thinking about be yes. Every opportunity I have, <laughs> say yes, because you don't know where that opportunity will take you. Yeah. So I've never set a specific goal. I've just said, hey, if this is going to be good for me, if this speaks to my soul, if this is authentic for me, say yes, work my butt at it, and see where it takes me. I never envisioned being a WNBA player. I never envisioned working for ESPN. Somehow, I was 6'3". And to, you know, becoming 6'3", somehow, <laughs> right? If y'all saw my mom, she's like 5'6". I'm like, how did I come out of you? Um, so never had these goals, but I had the mindset that, hey, I'm not going to take this opportunity for granted. I'm not going to take, you know, I'm going to study hard. I'm going to do everything to the best of my ability. Um, never wrote anything down, but I just said, hey, my hustle is going to be different. And, and that sort of defined who I am. So I never expected anything, but I definitely claimed it. Yep. How about you guys? You set goals? I do. I, it's taken me a long time, however, to say them out loud. I am very competitive, very driven, very ambitious, and for most of my life I was ashamed of all three of those things and did not want people to see those parts of me. They were there and they manifest themselves in the, being a sort of a workaholic and all these things, but, um, and I think this, a lot of women feel this way, right? We're, told that those aren't qualities we should project, that I should be, oh man, I'm so lucky to have this show. No, I'm not lucky. I Grateful. work my butt off, yeah. Yeah. and I'm really good. And, but, <laughs> thanks. That's but the it, worst, the, oh, you're so lucky. You're like, no, I'm not. Yeah, and, and but, <laughs> you know, you don't want to say a lot of your goals out loud, because it does, it can come, you, you can feel that it comes across as arrogant to say, yeah, I want to be on TV, yeah, I want to show, yeah, I want, and it's taken me a really long time to feel comfortable articulating those goals, even to myself sometimes. But that's been a more recent development for me. That's interesting. What do you think unlocked it for you? Realizing that if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to control the direction of my career. Yeah. Because as you're, like you, I've fallen into a lot of really cool and awesome things, and I think it's so great, so important to embrace those things that come to you, and that is probably more important than anything. But at a certain point, and you, I'm sure, realize this as well, Shanae, like, if you don't articulate like what you want to do when given those opportunities and the directions you want them to go we'll into, go, yeah. somebody else is going to dictate your path. Mm -hmm. Do you set goals? I do. I, uh, I started, I've, I've set goals since I was five. I told my mom, uh, I got asked when I, in kindergarten what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I was like, oh, I'm going to win a gold medal. And my teacher was like, okay. Like, <laughs> all right. And I drew the stick figure with, a, and I bedazzled the metal and everything. And I hung that up on my door. And then when I was 10, this show called Dancing with the Stars premiered. And I said, my mom was like, oh, I'm going to be on that show. My mom's like, after the gold medal? And I was like, yeah, probably. <laughs> she was like, okay. And, uh, and obviously uh, what happened after that was, was uh, not a goal or not something I, I imagined. But I remember in my vegetative state, with nothing but time to think, like too much time to think, I just set goals. And I decided, well, I'm going to use this time to, to, to imagine what my life is going to look like when I get out of this. So it was never an if, it was a when. Mm -hmm. Even though everyone else around me was, she'll never be a functioning member of society, she won't survive. And I was like, well, I have other plans. And so sometimes all you need is yourself to believe in you. And, um, and so... For me, it's always been that, and it wasn't a if I walk again, it was when I walk again. And so it was always kind of shifting my mindset, but I was very hesitant to share the goals I set. I mean, when I was younger, I didn't necessarily have, I just blurted out what I wanted to do. And then um, when I got better, I was told what I would never do. And so I always kind of kept things to myself. And then and then I just reached a point where I'm like, who, who am I? who are you to tell me what I'm capable of doing or what I'm capable of achieving? And so I just decided, I used my vegetative state as kind of a, it's a good like card to pull to be like, well, I, I was the one who was like, I'm getting out of this. And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. You're right, okay. <laughs> so that shuts people off. I don't like to pull the soggy broccoli stage of my life. Uh, that was the vegetable of choice, just saying. Uh, I don't like to pull that card, but I also was like, look, I was told I wouldn't even 
be here today. And so who are you to tell me that my goals are unattainable? And so I think after going through that and then seeing where my life has come in the last, you know, I think I've been out of my vegetative state for eight years now, um, to see where it's, where it's happened and I just have realized, and I keep a little journal and I'll write stuff down. And that took me a long time to even like share with my mom. And, and just be, or when people are like, what's next for you? Or what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, we'll see. I do that so much. It's so that bad. Too. It's so, like, you totally <laughs> shrink down. You're like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you're secretly like, yes, I do. You no, know? but like, you don't want to say it. And so it got to a point where I'm like, no, I'm just going to say it. Yeah. Or I'm not going to, I'm not going to shrink down. You got to hold your head up high, adjust your tiara and be like, this is what I'm going to do. And whether you like it, not in that voice. That yeah, was no, like, like Thor. That, that was like, like that Thor voice. princess yeah. edition. Um, no, but like, just be like, no, this is what I'm gonna do, and and uh, and I'll figure it out. And it's you know, we all have dreams and we all have goals, and and a lot of them seem impossible by standards. But impossible just means that I'm possible. You just have to kind of separate the two, and oh, I and uh, yeah, I always I have that on a sticky on note. I have a sticky note on my in my bathroom that says that, and and I've I've always said that, and um and it's just kind of like, look, you're possible. Just don't be afraid to speak it. But keeping it real, like we could have these goals. Yeah, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to be okay. President, granted, that's a great goal, but <laughs> yeah, peripherally you could be in the same category, touching lives, impacting things in a different way. So, yeah. you know, it's really interesting to see what you write down and actually what becomes of you, right? Yeah. Mm. Normally, I have always found that, like, we actually tend to, and the people I've spoken with, write down smaller, smaller goals than what they're actually picturing. And then when they turn around and see it come to pass or see what their life's become, it's actually far bigger I know I've had that. I'm sure we've all experienced that where we're like, oh, you know, I'm just going to do this. And then it's, it's by far bigger than what you could have ever imagined. And I think that's the beauty of it, too, is we tend to want to start small or write small. But it's really, you no, know, there's a far bigger, bigger thing coming around the corner. That's really interesting. So each of you talks about having this drive inside. And given that we're from the sports world, I just wanted to ask each of you, does sports create the drive for you or do you have the drive and so you end up in sports you know it's sort of interesting to hear each of you talk about mm -hmm. you know how your lives have have brought you in and out of the sports world at various points you know and I, I don't want to speak for all of us but I feel like our gender is the drive um, when I started playing in the WNBA I didn't really and actually it was before that I didn't really understand what the impact of putting a ball in a basket would be and um, I was at Stanford, and I would say like the hardest time in my career. My big sister and I are like twins. People think we're actually twins because we say we're twins, but we're not really twins. She's two years older than me. Um, <laughs> but I get why we're confused with the same height, same shade, you know. But um, <laughs> so I remember I was at Stanford, and my sister got drafted. She's having this glamorous career. Got drafted um, to the Sparks, number one. It was amazing playing with Candace Parker, and I saw that. And then I was at Stanford, and I was really, really trying to question like, who am I? Um, who's going to be the next step, you know, next leader in this program? And how are we going to get to that national championship? How am I going to get to where my sister is? Like, you know, comparing myself. And I feel like as women, um, we tend to be so competitive sometimes when instead we need to be more collaborative. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I started relying on her in a unique way. Like, how did you get through this? You know, how did you find a way to be consistent? And she just gave me her whole playbook, even through the WNBA. Like, I'm like, all right, man, I got to stop my amour. How do you do it? Um, and she'd tell me, oh, this is exactly how you do it. And I still couldn't get it done, but at least that helped me feel better going into the match. Um, but I had this really interesting experience. So I was at Stanford. My sister left. I was trying to figure out how I was going to, you know, try to keep the program relevant. Had an amazing keep mentor. Keep the program relevant. I FYI, mean, three title game appearances, <sighs> most rebounds ever in the history of Stanford basketball. So just as a result. But you still question yourself. <laughs> like, I didn't know if I could get it done. And at that time, I, was, I felt so much pressure. And um, I remember I was an international relations major. And the, I chose that major because it spoke to who I was, you know, being a, a child of the world and seeing different angles. I go to Nigeria twice a year, and I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go, went and studied abroad, I'll probably, probably get to that later. And when I went and studied abroad, I went and worked a, a basketball camp that was a foundation, and I 
It was the first time in my life that I saw basketball and people that loved it, but had no control over playing it. They couldn't play. Literally everyone came to that camp, 200 kids for one court, no shoes, um, no, wearing regular clothes. And I was like, wow. And they knew who I was. They knew who my sister was. Um, they knew my stats from freaking junior high. And I was like, whoa, it just blew my mind. And a lot of them were young girls. And those girls are, for a lot, you know, a large portion to, to us from perception, they're invisible. Their goals are invisible, their dreams are invisible, their opportunities are absolutely invisible. Um, because they have so many stereotypes over there about what girls should be doing. I even felt those stereotypes growing up. When my parents put me in basketball, my sisters and I in basketball, their peers were like, why are you putting them in basketball? They can't speak Igbo, Igbo is our natural language. They can't cook, they can't, um, they're not really being trained to be, you know, women in the most elementary, elementary vision of a woman, but my parents had another plan. They wanted to teach us to maximize every opportunity, and for me, going over there and seeing the young girls that didn't have the opportunity afforded to them, they can only live through my dreams by seeing it on, you know, going to a, a computer lab in the middle of the city that they have to trek and walk for without shoes. Like, to me, it, it made the game so real. Right, so what's my drive? It's knowing that these young girls exist and that they're living you know, vicariously through me and, and, and seeing me succeed and hoping that with my success, it'll allow people to let, unlock their own, right? And it's a universal thing. So playing in the WNBA, seeing a young girl say, I wanna play in the WNBA, that, that matters. Um, so for me, my drive comes from realizing that my game is not just my game, it's, it's holding everyone accountable. Um, it's creating opportunities for young girls to, to continue the legacy of playing the WNBA. We're the only league that has never folded 23 years strong, ever. Granted, we had a very serious point without a president, without a COO, um, but we are really invigorated. And I think a lot of people play in the WNBA right now, not because of the money, we all know that. Um, <laughs> We play for the love, right? We play for the respect. We play for the legacy. And that's what drives everything I do, knowing that as a woman, we can help others out by not being competitive, mm -hmm. by being collaborative. So as you talk about what drives you in these personal things, is that now what leads you to make certain choices in your career? 100%. I mean, being the first host of Sports Center Africa, that launched our programming when we launched ESPN Kwesi Africa. Um, you know, how much of that experience that you had in college being abroad informed that choice? Did that find you? Did you chase that opportunity? How did you? A hundred percent. And this goes back to like me not setting a grand goal, but mini goals, right? Yeah. Um, in college, I built a relationship writing blogs and all that stuff, and next thing you know, you're drafted to Connecticut. Not much to do in Connecticut, um, but, but work. <laughs> and work became fun, and it became my life, and you know, I'm building a family, like we just, it's just, we're having a blast already, um, just being here for a day. But yeah, I totally believe that everything that I am, and, and that's being African, being an athlete, being a nerd, you know what I'm saying? Um, they, they really end up manifesting. <laughs> I, get, I get the nerd, you know, it's a different looking nerd. Um, they all manifested into what I do and my passions. Like, Sports Center, what I do is I anchor. And that is a whole nother skill set than being an analyst. Like, reading shot sheets, conducting interviews, all doing it live, transferring news. And I would have never, ever signed up to do it. But I did it because it's Sports Center Africa. And there's a power in, to millions of viewers, seeing an African woman who is a female athlete um, being broadcast to everyone because next time they see a young girl, one of those young girls that came to the camp, they're gonna say, you know what? The host of that show, she's actually African and she transformed her life through sports. I think we should let you play. You know, that to me is the, the ultimate yeah. goal. I love, that. I love that. So how do you, I mean, similarly, you're making personal choices, right? How yeah. do you decide to go from being a financial journalist to saying, you know, hey, I'm going to be in sports, and then to go from That's a great leap, girl. sports writing yeah. <laughs> to say, hey, I'm going to be on TV. You talked about being more intentional about saying yeah. what you want, but talk to us about how you make those personal choices happen. I will say the second leap has been a lot more dramatic in my life. Uh, finance, the finance world is similarly, similarly male-dominated, okay? Um, there are more female journalists, I would say, working in there than in sports. Um, but it's the same, being a reporter is the same, whatever you cover. It's the same tools, it's the same analysis, that kind of thing. 
being an analyst, being on television, being an opinionator is very different from being a reporter. And what you're saying really speaks to me because my drive does come from the fact that a lot of it, and a lot of my decisions to say yes to things, to be on first take, which is, I don't know if you guys have watched that show traditionally, and like many sports shows, it's two dudes arguing and a woman in the middle. I'm one of the dudes arguing, yep. okay? And <laughs> <laughs> that's not a thing. That's, no, I'm that's actually, I'm, I think I'm like, there aren't other women on that, in that role, really. And that's quietly radical. And it's not even necessarily what I say, although I think my experience does inform it and gives me a different sort of background to weigh in on things. But the fact that I'm there, and I, and I always have people come to me and say, just turning it on and seeing a woman there kind of stops us in our tracks. And girls notice it. And it, in, when people, then when I'm criticized based on the content of what I'm saying, my takes, the heat of my takes, rather than how I look or being a woman, I love that so much and it happens more and more every day. So I love being a small part of normalizing a female presence in those roles on television and that really drives me to get better at them so that I can continue being that person. I love that. I love that. Mm. Victoria, you are having a personal impact with your sort of personal trajectory on a broad scale because, yeah. you know, in addition to doing everything on air that you're doing, you have become an inspirational speaker for large groups of people. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how you make that happen and how do you influence rooms of people <clears throat> with that kind of role? I, um, I never wanted to share my story. When I came back to life in 2010, I was going to move on with my life, I'm going to find normalcy. and. Uh, it wasn't until swimming took off for me that I was really asked the question, well, what's your story? And so I gave snippets, and uh, my snippets kind of threw people for a loop because it's not every day that, oh, yeah, by the way, for four years I was completely checked out from the world, and now I'm here. Uh, so um, it, was, it, was a, it was an ongoing thing for me to, to find more courage to share more. And uh, I just started kind of doing a few speaking speaking things after London. People want to see medals, so it's basically you go for people to pet pet the medal. That's how they. <laughs> I don't know why people pet it. I'm like, you can hold it, and they're like, no, I just want to touch it. <laughs> I just want to pet it. So people would just pet my medal, as weird as that sounds. <laughs> and along the way, I would give a few words and give a few more words, and then um, and then it just kind of took off for me. So for the last six years, I've just spoken and people like it and, and I didn't realize it. I mean, it's been a very bizarre thing because I wear so many different hats now and, and it really hasn't been until this last year when, when um, I wrote my book that I had more courage to share more and to actually realize there's an impact there. There's actually some, I think we, you have to own your story, but it took me a really long time to own my story and then once I did, it was astronomical how it just took off for me. And obviously, there's been a lot of really mainstream outlets in which it's been shared, but even me getting up on stage and being kind of the living, breathing miracle, if you will, of, of this story and overcoming it, I think it really exemplifies to people that, that nothing's impossible. And I like it because I have a balance because I get to share other people's stories mm -hmm. and then also share my story. So it's kind of finding a balancing act. Um, it's very, it can be hard though, because I'll go into these audiences and there's, you know, 2,000 people and they're twice my age. And they're these Fortune 500 executives and I'm like, I am not worthy of this. And I recently uh, did this really big corporate event and, and I was really nervous about it. And this individual, this executive came up to me afterwards and he was crying and he's like, I know you impact a lot of lives, but I'm pretty sure you just saved mine. And he had just gotten to the end of his rope and didn't want to come to this, this event. He came and realized that he still had more to give to this world. And so I think it's moments like that that really keep me driven to keep going and, and sharing my story as much as I want to just bury it under. I think we all have to sometimes put on that superhero cape, because we all have a story, and not be afraid to share it. Yeah. I mean, that's a powerful thing to think yeah. about. <laughs> Thank you. This idea that you're touching somebody's life so yeah. directly. Do you think about that in 
sort of one-on-one -on -one situations? Like, do you have, each have people in your lives that you mentor and that you give advice to, or do you not feel like you're at that stage yet? Absolutely, it's called my little sisters, right? Oh. So I'm the police. <laughs> Um, but it's just even funny, driving up, I was texting another uh, professional basketball player in the WNBA about, she's in China right now, and um, you know, if, people, if you're not familiar with the WNBA, we play in the WNBA from May to October, October to May, we play around the world because our money over there is bags. Um, and so she's in China, so literally, my sister's first paycheck came in a brown paper bag in Russia. I don't know if she wants you to know that, but, <laughs> but we were happy, but my mom was like, direct deposit, okay? Only, <laughs> feds watching. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just natural because, sorry, I'm making you choke, I can't. I'm just dying up here, sorry. it's fine. It's real life though, I mean, W even player. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think just being where we are at such a young position in our lives, people always say, how do we get there, right? And yeah. so um, I'm trying to be better myself, you know, texting back, because I'm horrible on the phone. Um, you know, and just trying to share what works for me, but also personalize it so what works for them. And then the hardest thing for me as a sister, my little sisters have it really tough because my big sister and I, we, we pretty much like we've done quote unquote at all in basketball and it's really hard for them because they have to live, yeah, and, and they play basketball and live in the shadow. But shout out to the baby. She just got preseason play of the year of our Conference USA. Very happy for her, Erica. Okay. Um, but yeah, so like just empowering people to be themselves and be confident in themselves because I visualize every person, especially every girl, to be my younger sister. And, and um, you know, they don't have to be a WNBA MVP like NECA or they don't have to work at ESPN. They're gonna be doctors and I feel like they're gonna impact and save even more lives. And to me, that's way more impressive than me going on TV, talking sports or putting a ball in a basket. Like they have these concrete goals that I'm impressed of. Um, so for me, it's just, you know, making sure I visualize everyone as someone in my family because it's been so personal to me. Yeah, you know, people always ask me, why aren't there more women in our field, especially as analysts, kind of what, I've, what I do. And one of the reasons is um, that there just haven't been. There ha you, you turn on TV and you haven't seen what I was describing earlier, the woman arguing, yelling on your TV. <laughs> but um, another reason is that the network isn't there. And so I do feel a responsibility to be that network for younger women um, because that's, these networks are what keep us out of these fields. And so that as much as we can strengthen them and expand them, especially from the top, I think it's a great responsibility when we get there. I think uh, I'm gonna radically shift. A lot of the folks I mentor are kids in hospitals, are individuals in vegetative states, are medical professionals um, to keep fighting and to have that, that um, perspective of we're all human, we all deserve the right respect and, and trust. And, and I think everything that I do is, is almost a testimony of that. Of there's no such thing as a lost cause. And so whether it's, it's in the sports world or, or you have a, a devastating medical condition, I think for me, a lot of my mentoring has been at, at hospitals, children hospitals and, and individuals who have these these uh, um, lost cause diagnoses. And so showing people that, hey, you don't have to go and be on television, you don't have to go and win a gold medal, but you can get there. We just gotta help you find a way to get out there, or find a way to communicate or find a way to to reach your own potential. And so I try to, I actually try to not even use what I've done as an, as an example, but more so like, hey, look, I've been there, I get it, you'll get there too. And so, you know, obviously we all have different paths, but just having that faith and having that belief that you're not a lost cause and your, your story doesn't end in defeat is kind of been my, what my mentorship has, has looked like. And I'm, I still consider myself a learner. So I still look up to like you ladies and, and you as well and, 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 uh, and probably mostly everyone in this room. So, hey, <laughs> um, so for me, that's still an ongoing thing, but my, I feel like the best way I'm suited in, in mentoring is, is other kiddos in situations like mine. I love that. Your story does not end in defeat. Strengthen the network, be intentional. Chase big things. That yes. I can't think of a better way to end this conversation. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>